Hello and welcome to this webinar on effective, inclusive and scalable training in the life sciences, clinical education and beyond. I'm Melissa Burke, I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer. Today I'm co-hosting this webinar along with Amy Nazelle from Melbourne Genomics, who is the Genomics Workforce Lead there. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case, this is the Turrbal and Yagara people of Mianjin, and for Amy, this is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. At the Australian Biocommons and at Melbourne Genomics, training and continuing education are core parts of what we offer the community. Earlier this year, the Biocommons and Melbourne Genomics were lucky enough to join more than 30 other trainers, educators and training providers in New York at the Banbury Centre Think Tank style meeting, where we tried to imagine how we can help make career spanning learning in the life sciences inclusive and effective for all. This project was initiated by Jason Williams and Rochelle Trachtenberg. And today we're thrilled to welcome our friend and colleague, Jason, to share some of, some of the outcomes of this meeting. Jason is the Assistant Director at the DNA Learning Center at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, where he specializes in teaching bioinformatics and data-driven science to high schoolers, PhD students, researchers, and more. Jason is amazingly passionate about connecting communities globally and is the founder of the Life Science Trainers, an international community and forum that connects anyone and everyone who does short format training in the life sciences. Welcome to the webinar, Jason. I'm now going to hand over to you to get started with the presentation. Wonderful, uh, thank you. Uh... Melissa and Amy and everyone uh, in Australian BioCommons, Christina, Melbourne Genomics, everybody uh, for the opportunity to present. So let me get started so we have as much time as possible um, for questions and discussions. And I am going to just put this into the correct uh, screen here. All right, excellent. And I'll also try to keep an eye on the time so that we don't spend too much time listening to me, but perhaps uh, have some questions. So um, I'll, I'll put this on at the end, uh, but uh, there is a website called bikeprinciples.org, which you're free to look at. Um, it'll be useful halfway through the, the presentation, you know, have it open, but pay attention to me for at least three minutes <laughs> uh, before you get to that. And then I'm on Twitter at Jason Williams NY. Uh, and then my email address will be at the end, but um, just want to make sure folks who are, have more questions can follow up and, and we'll get that facilitated. Um, as Melissa mentioned, um, this work is really the work of many, many people. And here are just about all of them uh, gathered with us last May in New York uh, at the Banbury Center, which is a, a small uh, unit within Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory where I work uh, and where I've actually worked with my colleague Amy uh, before. Uh, and it's really a, a think tank, as I said, uh, trying to bring people together across multiple disciplines to work on interesting challenges. And if you've uh, decided to take a little bit of time to join us today, um, then perhaps training is something that's interesting to you. And I perhaps uh, will um, provoke some thoughts. Uh, so I want to just take a moment to acknowledge all of those people. There's two slides uh, where I have their names up right, uh, right up front. Uh, I'll put them up for a moment. I know it will not uh, really capture <laughs> all the gratitude for all of these people, um, but I just wanted folks to know that this really is uh, a, a, a diverse swath of people that were involved in, in this work. I also want to acknowledge funding from the U.S. National Science Foundation, uh, which supported um, this uh, the work of the meeting and our time in developing uh, some forthcoming manuscripts. Okay, uh, so... Are we wasting our time with training? I think every um, good uh, project starts with anxiety and uncertainty about uh, something. And this is a question that I, I, I've had. Um, and why would I have that question? Well, one of the reasons uh, is this paper uh, from 2017, uh, which was an interesting look uh, in the United States 
at short format training uh, for PhD students in the life sciences. Uh, and they had this really nice, and I guess um, this is as close to a sensationalism that you need to have when you're in a uh, Proceedings of National Academies uh, paper. It's really direct that they find when they were looking at these students who'd taken short format workshops that, that this group uh, really couldn't detect evidence of the effectiveness of those workshops. Um, and this is was uh, alarming to me, um, none the least because I spent a lot of time, uh, including in Australia, uh, I visited uh, previously for the sake of getting researchers and educators uh, involved in, uh, in bioinformatics and data. And really the only vehicle I have to do that is short format training. Uh, so I really was interested in, in that question. Are there assumptions that we have about the effectiveness of something that we rely on in order to communicate our work, new science, uh, and to get other researchers on board? And at the same time, for those of us, and I suspect many who are on this call do training, uh, we've seen the evidence and the outcome of people who approach us, uh, people who we work with, who, who do take our workshops and do find it to be uh, beneficial. So this is an interesting thing. Uh, and then there was another paper um, as I was uh, conceiving of a conference to really ask that question amongst a group of people who are smarter and more experienced uh, and more diverse than uh, I would, would be as an individual. Um, this paper, uh, which, which is actually from the National Bureau of Economic Re Research, uh, actually talked about the STEM workforce, and it really made an, an argument, which I do think is true, that new technologies are coming along all the time. And it, it turns out, you know, I think the same as in Australia, as in the United States and most countries, um, it, it's very common to hear calls that we need to, to produce more STEM graduates. Um, there's a shortage of STEM graduates. We need, we need more. Um, but what this paper made the argument was that in STEM, uh, the, the rate of change, the rate of new skills is so quick that actually what tends to happen is that uh, people, older graduates, get to a point at which they're mature in their experience of work, but they may not be up on the latest skills. They may not have had um, continuing um, professional education to allow them to take on new skills. And so maybe they can't get the next promotion or they can't do the next research project as effectively as, as others entering. And so they made the argument, it's that the skills were, were scarce and not the workers themselves. Um, in some work that we did earlier at the Learning Center, when we were looking a few years back at investigators who are funded by the National Foundation, we found that of the different needs that those investigators had for cyber infrastructure and working with big data biology, um, the top three of a dozen or so needs were all in areas of training uh, that they felt that those were the most unmet needs. And so clearly there is an appetite uh, for training. Uh, and, and my question was, is that something that we can make better? One of the things that uh, I've really come to believe in, in thinking about some of the problems that surround what we're calling short format training, which I'll define now as saying uh, training that is uh, showing up for a webinar, sometimes at its shortest, perhaps, where you might just have an hour, to uh, a couple of days of a workshop. Um, that's not the same as what we traditionally think of an education as long format training when you are with a uh, taking a semester long course, which most of us do during our formal degree and then uh, not so much afterwards. Uh, there are a number of features um, that contribute to making a long format teaching, in a formal teaching in a classroom. I won't guarantee that it's always effective, as some of my education uh, expert friends are, but there are at least some features that almost all of it has in common. One, it's long, uh, so you're usually taking it for a quarter or a semester. The format oftentimes is lecture heavy, although there definitely can be hands-on, and there's certainly move uh, to increase the hands-on in many cases in the sciences. Um, Oftentimes there are articulated and enforceable prerequisites. You can't take uh, a 300 level class before you've taken uh, a 100 and a 200 before it. Uh, the learners are often in the same track where they have pre-specified uh, preparation and needs that are um, fairly uniform, I'd argue. And there's an expectation that the person who gets in front of the room is qualified to teach, um, that they ha have some 
uh, ability and experience and qualification to teach. Um, they may not have a degree in pedagogy, uh, but they they do. There's that expectation. There's also regulation. Um, there may be standards that the university enforces for instruction, accreditation of certain programs. There may even be legal requirements that the university uh, must uh, meet in order to call itself a functioning school. Um, there's often a sequence, which means that that learning takes place in the context of a major and a minor, where there are other prerequisite or additional courses. And uh, when I this term I call variance makes uh, when you when you take if I say that I'm a biology major at the University of Melbourne or I'm a biology major at um, Princeton University or whatever university you'd like to name, there's going to be a lot in common that you can pre predict about what those experiences might look like. Enter a short format training, which is, I've just marked it as this sort of blob because there are areas where in, in sometimes it, it might look very much like long format training, except for maybe the, the time. Um, and it really depends, right? A very experienced uh, group of trainers, like you're likely to find giving a pitch for uh, Australian Biocommons, um, that short format training may look very different than a one-off uh, short format training done by two or three individuals who are just getting some colleagues together. Um, so yeah, it, it, it'll be short. The focus often is on interactive, hands-on. Prerequisites often though are either unarticulated or unenforceable. You really have to deal with who came to you. Um, learners may be various levels of preparation for the experience that you hope to deliver and you might not have much control. Um, the instructor, there's an, ex, there's an expectation the instructor is a domain expert, perhaps in science or medicine, but not necessarily a pedagogical expert or even having any type of pedagogical experience. And it's also a lot less likely to be regulated. Um, in, in many cases, it may be more informal um, and that there wasn't a university approval process. Oftentimes, other standards go by the wayside, including for accessibility. Um, if there is a sequence available, because there may often not be, it might be one single course or maybe a two-part course, um, it's really a lot of uh, effort is placed on the learner. And so I rate this uh, experience as, very, as uh, the variance of this uh, experience as unpredictable and, and not really repeatable, right? If I say I'm taking an RNAC course um, with Australian Biocommons, they may not really resemble, there, I'm sure there'll be some domain um, overlap, but it might not really resemble the same type of learner experience and teaching environment and um, attention to pedagogical rigor that you would get in uh, a one-off workshop done by somebody who's never taught before at some place who they're an expert, but they've just never taught it. Um, one thing that all of these experiences will have in common is that there is formal evidence about teaching that applies. And so how do we infuse that? How do we get that and other elements um, to be uh, applied to short format training, maybe making it a little bit more regular? Well, uh, I'm gonna obviously give you uh, our, our pitch as, as to what the answer is, but I also like to keep in mind that um, and there was a, a great question, which I guess we'll get to because one of the pre-submitted ones about, yeah, I've gone to webinars, people have presented things, how do we apply it, right? Um, and so what I want to say at the back is that this is going to be a big project uh, to change any person's behavior uh, or to recommend people uh, try something new. So uh, I think we will at this, um, in, in this webinar, I hope to communicate a few uh, interpretable ideas uh, if I'm successful. Uh, but the real project is going to be around building communities and, and supporting communities around these principles, which I'm going to talk about. Um, because um, you'll forget half the stuff that I could say at this webinar, more than half, maybe 90%. Um, but if I can get across um, some principles, some ideas that resonate with you because you've probably been thinking themselves and maybe we put a label on them that resonates, um, then I think that that's the first step to moving forward. Um, I thought so too uh, when I first started this project a few years ago, as Melissa mentioned, and I'll put in another plug uh, for livesidetrainers.org. Um, this is a community uh, online. It's it's Slack, it's free. There's, there's It's all volunteer effort, um, which was an attempt to say, um, having had a chance to travel the world, um, being very privileged uh, to meet so many wonderful trainers across um, countries, it was just a place to put together a, a, a forum for people to exchange as many or as few ideas as they would like. Uh, it just so happens I, I, I picked a, a Slack 
question. This is a free thing. You know, I didn't know I was doing this today for Melissa, but there was a question for Melissa. And this is exactly my dream of what this uh, Slack would be. Maybe there could be more, but really for somebody to just throw out, hey, I have a question. There are not all that many people in the world that concern themselves with short format training professional development for life scientists. How can I ask them uh, that question? So uh, please, everyone, feel free. We have monthly calls, and uh, if there are questions at the end, I can come around to that. Um, but building a community, which is great, I can put up a Slack for free, we can have a little website, um, that, that's a first step. And so how do we actually support the community with tools or begin to support the community of tool, uh, which is all of you, with tools that could actually, um, you know, achieve more? Uh, so, hence, uh, this project on what has now come to be known after the meeting that we had in May, and, and this idea of the bicycle principles. And as you kind of will guess, there are two cyclic uh, sets of ideas, uh, and it so happens that a bicycle is a, is a nice metaphor for that. So, I'll try to introduce this um, one step at a time. Um, but I, I will mention, yeah, that, that the idea here, the key idea is trying to reinforce that idea of effective short format training. What might that look like? Inclusive short format training. Um, how are some, I think every one of us might be excluded in one way or another, and how can we fight against uh, uh, that, that uh, circumstance to become inclusive? And also career spanning, uh, where we think about the context of the needs of individuals across their entire career, especially in a world where science and scientific domains, medicine uh, changes um, on a monthly basis in ways that would, might be difficult to predict. Okay, so the first part is that this needed to be a community-driven strategy. No one cares what I think, as I'm reminded, uh, in many ways, including my dog, uh, who does not come often, <laughs> unless there's guarantee that I've got food. Um, so how do we actually develop a strategy that really comes from all of you? So whether you were at that meeting or not in, in, in um, the Banbury Center, the hope is, is that what we presented actually captures things that you're doing uh, and, and brings you uh, to the table by, by just sort of saying, we, we're with you. Um, and so hence that meeting uh, that was mentioned, uh, and that, that is uh, also acknowledging here as was in an earlier slide, uh, the organizing committee, which again, uh, spanned uh, a, a global effort. And as you can imagine, at things that happen at meetings, there's all sorts of loops and, and ideas and plans. Uh, there's virtual, especially since we were hybrid, uh, post-it notes. I, I don't think you can have an agreement uh, of, of minds without post-it notes. And there was even a, a lunar eclipse uh, that begun the meeting so that we had really everything that we could possibly have uh, to try to get uh, some success out of this. And so what we came up with uh, really was a set of principles. Um, we've known since Moses uh, that, you know, people can remember five or 10 things and you put them on a tablet and maybe people will understand and remember at least that there's, there's, there's a few of them. But as I said, um, it's really there to label and capture the best of what many, but not everyone, uh, might do. So I, I suspect that many of these will resonate, but some of these may be areas where you're, you'll say to yourself, you know, I do want to do that, but I don't know exactly how. Um, the principles are also there to provide a path for individuals or groups to develop a more predictable experience of what short format training could be. Um, some people will be functioning groups like BioCommons, like Melbourne Genomics, but others will be really sort of on their own at their own institutions. So a set of principles could be a potential guide, no matter what your context is. And then finally, the principles uh, are, are a mechanism to enshrine values and practices which may get lost due to scarce resources. So by its nature, you have limited time, um, limited experience uh, often, and maybe even limited awareness. If you're doing it on your own, you may not know what other groups are doing and how you could benefit from them. So these are some, um, maybe not all, but at least some that came to mind in, in writing this talk uh, of what the principles could, could do for us. Um, so let me state the core principles, uh, and then I'll, I'll say what the bicycle is. So we do have these uh, short, punchy statements, and then I'll try to come back around to them. Um, for people, well, in, in the next slide, I'll tell you when it's useful to veer off to the website because you've gotten tired of me, and maybe you'll just put me in the background as you look for yourself. But one, there are these sets of core principles, which we believe every short format training experience 
uh, should uh, work towards. Uh, so one, that all uh, training really needs to use the best evidence uh, uh, in, in developing the, the pedagogical core of that training. Um, there are recommendations, existing bodies of literature about how to design uh, a teaching experience long or short effectively, whether that's learning outcomes, whether that's um, taking measurement of the progress of your learners, which I'll mention next, but using committing to an evidence-based practice. Um, and for short format training, interestingly, um, there'll be a lot of areas where there isn't published literature, but there's the experience of your colleagues uh, who have done things and tried them. And so it, although much of that work, uh, unfortunately, doesn't get captured in, in formal publications, um, it is out there. And, and our recommendations also uh, address that. Number two is uh, this idea of catalytic learning. And simply stated, what we mean there is that there, there's a formal responsibility to think about the learner and what they're going to do after um, your your training, your workshop. Uh, in some cases, your 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 short format training may be just in time uh, training where there's only a single skill, a very simple thing like, hey, here is the new website for using uh, Blast. Uh, we've made these three changes, and you know what? Ninety percent of the people that website that webinar would probably be all that they need in order to move to the next step. But oftentimes, uh, we are providing our learners with more where what we give them at the workshop is not going to be enough to really do everything that they need. So how do we think about preparing them to, to be catalytic? How do we uh, demonstrate to our learners that, that the experience that they've had, our training, is actually effective? In other words, uh, proving to the learner, and often really the evidence comes from assessment or evaluation of learner, that they've actually can demonstrate um, that a skill that you try to communicate in your workshop is, is, is something that they now walk away being able to do. So being effective means giving that evidence to a learner. And then the final uh, core principle is to be inclusive, to really think about how your training can maximize the ability of all learners to participate and benefit. So that's the set of what we call core principles. But as I said, there's another set of principles uh, that one could use and these are what we call community principles. And these apply when your training is going beyond just reaching a single group or a single experience at a single institution, but when you're actually trying to take that training or those learning materials and scale it to either other people who will do that training for you or who will take what you've written and move it to other groups. And when you're trying to reach large numbers of learners. So anything where you're now going into a space where the training is going to be collaborative. So uh, the first of three there is reach. Um, you should work to include new types and larger audiences of learners. And um, doing that requires perhaps modifying training materials or thinking about how those materials were developed. Uh, and that might not have been where you started. When we talk about scale, and that means supporting uh, the, the trainers themselves. So if you think about training the trainers would be an example of uh, working with larger numbers of instructors and instructional developers, who again may have a different set of needs in the learners. And then finally, sustaining. Um, once you develop training materials, how can you use practices that might increase or, or at least maintain the availability and the usability and the relevance of those materials? Um, the reliability, we know things go stale pretty quickly in the sciences. What are other infrastructures that you need in order for something to be made sustainable? How can we consider that and, and plan for that and do the best that we can or seek support, especially when a training is uh, valuable to another community? So um, if you are a small group and you're not really looking to scale, you might just be uh, using a unicycle where you use just the core principles. And if you're a larger group, uh, there's the bicycle. And that's where you have to think about uh, entire communities of people working together to reach scale and sustain that training. So what comes next from this, you know, you have a set of principles, is actually the principles are very high level. Um, obviously, they're open to interpretation, um, but there's many layers of guidance that you now need to think, well, how do we actually turn something that's a bit abstract into something that's a little bit more concrete? Um, well, what the group next developed and is still in the process of uh, com 
you know, developing, enriching, fleshing out is recommendations to help individuals implement those principles. And this is when I'm very much excited to know what you think in the audience. And I'll mention at the end the mechanisms that we're doing right now to collect feedback and, and help make things um, much more concrete. Um, again, we've known since in this case, and, and guess in my second religious metaphor, uh, you've known since Martin Luther, uh, you can make lots and lots of statements, uh, and then how people follow them, um, there's a variety of outcomes, some good, some bad. Um, so I'm going to go through them. And as I go through these recommendations, I've become fascinated with these text-to-image AI generators. If you've ever seen them where you enter a couple of words of text uh, on a website, and then the artificial intelligence actually draws a picture. Uh, and so almost all of my recommendations are not really concrete. And so you could just look at text, uh, which is a little bit boring, I think. Uh, but do go to bikeprinciples.org and you can see the full text. But so that I have an image that goes with it and then possibly doesn't violate copyright from trying to find some image to represent an abstract concept for 14 different recommendations that I have, I... Each um, recommendation that I'm about to show you, and there are 14 of them, will be accompanied by an artificial intelligence generated uh, image, and the image will have a prompt, so you know what I what I wrote in the machine. So I wrote in, you know, scientist in a lab coat riding a bicycle, and it literally drew that. Uh, so that's awesome because if you've ever needed to put images in your slides and you can't find just the right image, if it's not. An, if it's not a figure, of course, uh, this is my solution for now. Okay, so credit to that website, which is at the bottom. So let me go through the, the recommendations rather quickly because I'll, I'll try to keep to just 10 seconds about saying them and I'll give you time for the image. Okay, uh, okay. So uh, recommendation A uh, was about, uh, the prompt is a doctor studying a textbook and you see the image, okay, you get it? It, it did a good job. This is a cartoon version. Uh, this idea of professionalizing uh, the training of short format training instructors and instructional designers. Uh, so this is a lot to unpack. <laughs> uh, let me try to just say it in a sentence or two. Um, there are almost all of us have taken a workshop or taught a workshop. Uh, but for those of us who are instructors, um, we may or may not have gotten training in short format training. There will be other instructors that come along after us. How can we professionalize that process so that all instructors who do short format training have access to training materials themselves that can work across many different contexts? Uh, as you'll see in this whole, uh, in the last few minutes here as I'm wrapping through these, very little of it is specific to the life sciences. So there's lots of things that are, 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 broad, are broadly available. And you also have people um, like uh, Melissa and Amy who are on the call who are instructional designers who may help the instructors to design the curriculum or support them in very various ways. How can we professionalize that process? And that includes not only learning materials for those, for those folks, but even rewarding them and acknowledging their work in a way that really makes that a cohesive uh, and important component of uh, the research community. So that was Ren recommendation. Uh, the next one was uh, centralizing infrastructure for short format training assessment and evaluation. Um, so one thing that tends to happen not as well as you might hope for short format training is assessment. Uh, most workshops do end with some type of assessment. How did you like the workshop? Uh, was the coffee good? Was it strong enough? Um, but in a lot of cases, we don't do rather rigorous assessments uh, for, for various reasons. But there are uh, ways and approaches and principles where we could do better job. And this is related to another recommendation which will come later. And one of the first things we can do is centralizing that effort by providing resources that instructors could turn for, uh, for help with developing their own assessments. Next one, support micro-credentialing for short format training instructors. So if you are an instructor, uh, providing the, the ability for you to get a credential in that area would be a way to demonstrate to others that you are really a, an accomplished instructor. Uh, it would be a signal um, to learners that you really are caring about the discipline. And so that's something that is uh, the ability to, um, within our realm of possibility. I'll also comment here, since I had to write, uh, female student, uh, that the AI is a bit sexist. 
Uh, so I had to instruct it at certain times because it wasn't getting uh, quite a bit of imbalance. Okay, Oper this is a, oh, this is many syllables. Operationalize equitable and inclusive practice in short format training as an ethical obligation. Okay, what do I mean here? Uh, well, I think all of us have a desire to work towards inclusion and also accessibility, but oftentimes it really is uh, an afterthought, unfortunately. We, are, we have an hour to teach something. We have half a day to teach something. We are very focused on the science. But if we really were to consider the ethics and inclusion aspects of our training as ethical obligations, then that really um, you know, increases the level of attention and even the level of resources that we should command and have available to us so that we can include everyone in, in the um, training events that we put on. Uh, deploy short format training to counter inequity. Uh, so one of the things I also care about is the ability of short format training to take researchers, uh, scientists, uh, clinicians who are in one position in their job and in their career who might be seeking to go to that next position and, and, and acknowledging that our colleagues across the globe in often cases don't have the same opportunities, even though they may have the same degree, um, there may be skills that they haven't had the chance to get. And so thinking about how all training in some way could contribute to the effort of uh, reaching the those who are not yet reached uh, and making sure that scientists, uh, like I said, the whole group of stakeholders has a better chance at uh, getting achieving their career objectives by making sure that training is accessible to them and that we actually direct resources to, to accomplish that. This next one I, is the golden bicycle um, because the funders have the money. And so uh, thinking about ways to present the bicycle principles in ways that funding agencies can incorporate into their requirements. Uh, as you, uh, I think, you know everywhere, funding agencies are becoming very serious about data sharing and there are policies and plans in place on that level. But funding agencies also support a great deal of training and, and professional development that is in the short format category. And so uh, if these principles really are um, of the community and have the support of the community, then it's in the funder's interest that when they support and fund short format training, that it follows principles like these to make it inclusive and effective and career spanning. The next one is this idea of economic models that enable short format training. Uh, short format training is not alone in areas of academia where it relies upon labor that may be uncompensated. Um, and so there is also conflict with some of the other uh, recommendations because we also do want training to be free so that everyone can get it. Um, so there is a wider discussion that needs to be have here uh, needs to uh, be undertaken here. Uh, and while compensation uh, doesn't necessarily always need to be money, um, there are other ways to make sure that we acknowledge and and think about areas of which uh, things that we depend upon in short format training might actually require. Uh, labors and efforts that are currently uncompensated, and how can we work to make that more equitable? Almost done there. The next one is the idea of high fidelity um, sharing. So uh, there's my hi-fi radio set uh, drawn in an anime style, did a good job. Uh, what we mean by this is that there are uh, different groups who know how to increase the reach and the scale uh, of their short format training. They know how to sustain short format training, but oftentimes the their models for doing so, uh, again, I, I, I keep throwing uh, uh, praise to Australian BioCommons, those models may not be shared with everybody or communicated in ways that everyone uh, immediately knows how to apply to their own context. So creating ways to document that, creating ways to share those efforts uh, with fidelity. In other words, that when we do replicate things in other, in new context for new audiences, that um, we don't lose what made uh, the original set of training effective and inclusive. Uh, there's also the idea of applying fair principles to training materials. So I guess somehow uh, sh sharing training materials is like sharing lollipops. That's what prompt I thought of. Uh, and what we mean here, uh, I think many people are aware of the idea of FAIR, that uh, in, in this case, data should be made findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, other groups, including uh, this one, have been working to do the same for training materials. And we think that that's a great practice that everyone uh, should really consider uh, how they can make training materials something that everyone can benefit from and enjoy and share. 
Uh, the other thing is, is the idea that training uh, should be registered in ways that people can find it. Uh, and there may be training that happens in Australia that's interested uh, of interest to people in Argentina uh, and vice versa. But oftentimes those training, a list of training opportunities and training materials are siloed and isolated and not connected. And while we don't think it's realistic to say that there should be one true source for all training materials everywhere, um, there are ways uh, by technology that training material uh, registries that are created could be made to be exchangeable and interoperable so that people could build and share um, as often as they would like. The next one is for the learners, and it's to communicate to learners uh, by creating systems of badging. In other words, if a, if a certain training meets a, a recognized uh, criteria for being inclusive, uh, doing things like using a code of conduct, uh, living up to that code of conduct, well, that training should get a badge uh, that learners can use to differentiate a high quality instruction from instruction that might not have reached that level of quality yet. Uh, and so this gives an opportunity for learners to have more of a voice because often they won't know enough uh, just walking into a situation uh, to ask for what they would like. Uh, but by creating standards that everyone can um, agree on and that are transparent, uh, then you empower the learners to decide. Uh, and then when uh, certain trainings don't have certain badges, uh, that gives them the, the encouragement and motivation to achieve that badge because learners can decide uh, what they would really insist on. Um, the idea of catalytic learning that was uh, mentioned earlier uh, needs implementation help. And so uh, doing actual research because it's a novel construct uh, was one of the recommendations. And we've got two more. One, uh, the, the integration of diagnostic assessment. So this is related to what we said earlier, uh, that we need to assess our learners. Um, this one is more instructor uh, focused or instructor centered because instructors can um, be prompted to do that individually. Whereas the earlier recommendation on assessment was, would be for interoperable um, and, and centralized resources, which would be a larger project. And finally, um, evidence-based guidance to support career-spanning learning. So here is my, I don't know, maybe it could be like a Pokemon map or trail map or something or guide. So that one in the anime style uh, could work. The idea here is, is that uh, we often focus a lot of efforts, rightly so, on early career, um, whether it's trainees, uh, whether it's early career faculty. But really, uh, you know, I think scientists are loose, are useful uh, for decades in, in, in most, not all cases. Uh, but we want to make sure that across uh, the career span, there really are places where people can look for, especially if they're working in an interdisciplinary context that might not even existed when they started their career. So really thinking about providing those guidance. Okay, so that was uh, a tour through the recommendations accompanied by an AI-generated image. Um, so how do we share these ideas and move to next steps? Uh, one, as I said, uh, go to the website. Uh, we will uh, post announcements there as we're doing things. And um, there is also a way for you to give us some feedback. So every one of these um, recommendations is accompanied by a summary, a little bit of a vignette on how this might work. Um, it talks about related principles, potential benefits to learners, incentives to implementation, and also potential barriers. Uh, there's also a survey where we have an idea from different stakeholders, what they think. Have we, have we described these correctly? Are, are we missing something? Um, and then to build out the community further, uh, one of the things that you can do today uh, on the website or, um, well, through, through this link or QR code if you care to, is uh, we have, of course, on the website, a forum where people can ask questions uh, openly. It's great to do it that way because other people may have the same questions as you. Uh, we have a mailing list so that you can be advised, especially as the publications become available. Um, we're also doing some focus groups and, and additional surveys. So if you're interested in giving us feedback, um, perhaps we can say a little bit more later, but I will um, have the privilege of traveling in person um, to Melbourne in a few weeks and there'll be some activities around this. Um, but even before that, um, people can let us know if they'd like to give us more feedback, if they if they have questions, comments, ideas, and all of these things would be um, 
to set the stage for future funded efforts to find which of these recommendations and uh, have the most traction and, and what the uptake in the community might be. So we really invite you all to share and join in. Um, this really is meant to reflect the best of what all of you do, uh, because like I said, I know that there are quite a number of trainers who would come to something like this. So with that, I will end my talk there, uh, leaving us a little bit of time for time and discussion. I always end, typically end with this quote uh, about uh, the really just the need for continuous relearning and acknowledge um, my home institution uh, and also one of my projects, Cybers, uh, which contributed to that, and my Twitter and my email there, I'm williams at cshl.edu. And with that, I will uh, stop sharing and then um, hand off to discussion. So thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for that, Jason. I just adored that <laughs> walk. Um, Melissa, did you want to wrap up the talk and then I'll um, ask a couple of the questions that were pre-submitted? I think we're fine to go straight into questions, but I'll just remind people that if you do have a question, and we're getting lots of applause coming up on the screen as well, if you do have a question, pop that into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer it for you. So while people are possibly um, popping some questions in, we did get a few um, beforehand, Jason. Um, I'll run through those now. The first one is, is there a plan to promote the principles through the Research Data Alliance communities? Um, these acronyms are new to me, so apologies if I'm saying them wrong, ETHRD and IG, or beyond that. Uh, so uh, the answer to all of that will be yes. I don't always know how, <laughs> uh, but I think that um, we are very eager for people to take this back to their communities because all of you will have more reach than the initial set of us. And of course, um, the, the publication, which is forthcoming, would be a major sort of stake in the ground to uh, or flag in the ground to let people know and signal that. So uh, my hope is, is that we move to a place where we've articulated things really clearly and we empower individual people who can believe in the principles themselves and may have their own take on them to go out and do that work for us. Uh, that being said, we also hope to attract funding um, for various agencies. So if people are interested in digging in or are interested in promoting, um, we can support that work wherever and however we can. So um, please make sure you leave comments like that on the feedback forum, ideas that are already uh, you know, starting to come in from various ways. And I'll, I'll keep notes from this, um, this experience so that we know who to reach out. But we, we love your opinions and your help in reaching those uh, communities mentioned and any others uh, that might be interested in, in adopting this. I can attest to that. When I was sitting in the meeting at Banbury, I think I was one of the only people in the room that was coming from a clinical genomics perspective. And it was fascinating constantly applying my thoughts about what, how these would work in my world. And, um, and you've supported um, us and Australian Biocommons are supporting you to come to Australia and then we're leveraging that. So we're doing one of those activities in Melbourne in December and some of the people online today are going to be part of that. So to the person who wrote that question, I've taken that question and inserted, is there a plan to promote these principles through the clinical genomics education communities? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and it's, um, it's an individual who can make that happen, as Jason said. Um, the next question is, how much do you rely on participant feedback to gauge the effectiveness of a training session? And this popped into my mind as well when I saw you put up that particular recommendation. I noticed that your description of effectiveness focused on actually the learner knowing that the program was effective for them. And I always think of effectiveness as also being the stakeholders know that it was effective as well. So either the funders or whomever it was. So the question was, how much do you rely on participant feedback to gauge effectiveness? Yeah, so uh, if I'm just answering that really directly in terms of how, you know, how it might happen for any uh, short format training, um, uh, you know, the, I think the idea there, and there were a number of experts uh, in assessment and education, is that um, it's it's kind of a it's a conversation. Both the learner and the the instructor wants to know that if I've if I've taught something that that you've gotten it uh, and that you you can demonstrate that skill, and also you coming to the course when you first do that 
the thing that you learned on your own. I mean, that's the evidence that, you know, you, you can do it now. Um, so what, what I think, you know, not, none of that is new. What I think um, we are trying to make a push for is to sort of say, there's a lot of short format training where we only capture um, sort of a sentiment analysis. Do you feel that the training was a good training? Do you feel that um, the experience was pleasant? And those are important uh, qualitative things to capture. But we also know from the research that people aren't always the best judge of, of what they think that they learned. Uh, and so it's an area, you know, that um, that truth be told doesn't happen in a long format where you do have a test and unfortunately you can get an F. I've gotten them. It's not pleasant, right? Um, so how can we balance those needs and and a, and a realistic assess a realistic understanding of the time and context to do a bit more and to think about how we structure the the teaching process so that there are assessment diagnostic assessments to use the more general term built in to the to the training a few you know a multiple choice question um, a challenge exercise what are the more approachable things that we can integrate so I hope that that answers the question. But yeah, I think both groups, oftentimes, um, I guess we have this, this say, saying in the States, and maybe it's also in Australia, that uh, the customer is always right. Uh, so I think demanding that the learner can can prove to themselves, um, we hope by extension, uh, is, is means that the, the instructor can prove to uh, themselves that learning has, has taken place in the, in the way that they hoped. Yeah, and it's also often a, a funding or a timing issue, you know, being able to extend your evaluation so far that you're getting workplace feedback that they've accomplished and implemented what they've learned in your program in your short format training. It, it, it's sometimes not possible. We all strive to get to that point, but it may not be feasible. Um, and the last question that was pre-submitted was the new approach, insight or information from a webinar or a once-off lecture is rarely applied. <laughs> it's a bit of a depressing statement. Can this ever be overcome? Yeah. For it. Rip up, yeah. Uplift us, Jason. Say yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the question is, do we want to take responsibility for that as instructors? Um, and if we do, uh, what would that mean? So I think it's, uh, except for some few, you know, very basic skills, like in that just-in-time training, where I literally just need that five minutes of a YouTube video that shows me what command to enter or that reveals something that I just didn't pick up from, from reading through instructions. You know, that's sort of, I guess, the trivial case. What I think that this question is speaking to is how can you, um, with short format training, really move someone along um, a continuum of path in their professional development? And so does that actually mean that uh, funders and uni universities who support uh, or projects who support short format training are are doing a disservice by sponsoring or thinking about the way they deliver short format training as just isolated one-offs and not saying if we're doing short format training and the level of the topic is 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 of such a level of sophistication, then we actually need to make sure that there are multiple trainings or that there are trainings plus the additional teaching materials post-workshop that the learner could feasibly achieve this on their own because you've just gotten to that point. That's one of the, um, that's what the catalytic um, recommendation is about and the catalytic principle is to really consider that in many cases, just for the sake of being practical and honest, we won't be able to do as grand a, a, a sort of, um, all-encompassing entry into short format training that we would like to present to the learners, but there might be other realistic things that we can do to support them in ways that we kind of don't think about sometimes because we just sort of say everyone had to learn on their own. Um, and that's true. And, you know, people will, a subset of people will, but some people won't. Or um, some people, you know, the, 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 the progress of the science may be slower. And in my mind, I always thought, like what we saw with the pandemic, that there's so many interesting and even pressing scientific challenges. If we can make something happen 10% faster, that may mean, mean a lot. Um, so I'm all for, you know, rethinking some of what we've come to accept, and especially as 
science becomes more interdisciplinary and more challenging. <clears throat> You or, did provide an uplifting answer. Sorry. I was just saying you did provide an uplifting answer. Good on you. <laughs> I was just thinking as well as, as Jason was replying that maybe we need to shift our perspective on webinars and lectures a little bit and what makes them effective. It could be that these are more about giving people a taster of a topic so that they can decide if they do want to pursue more training on that. And that is actually an effective and useful thing for those people rather than it being the the way that we try to get people to apply skills so we as trainers we need to be thinking about what type of event are we doing and what do we want to get out of it and do those two things match up as well i agree so much with that um because i, I think that the very first thing is to be honest uh, the learner has no idea how complicated or how how, how easy uh, a, a given subject might be if they have really had no exposure to it. But we probably, as instructors, probably do have some sense. And if we're being very honest to sort of saying, listen, I, in fact, I, I, I often have workshop slides that say, here's what I cannot teach you. You are not going to get this in the next couple of hours for me. And, and here's here's all I can give you. So I'm honest about that. But here's how you can get there once you're done with what I am able to get you. And just sort of that mindset change, I think, even though it might sound simple, I think it's potentially quite valuable uh, because I have, you know, um, is there anything more desperate than, a, well, don't want to sh shut anyone down, but is there anything more desperate than a graduate student trying to finish their thesis and you are what's standing in the way, that, that one technique or that one thing? they really are coming to you because they 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 saw what you had is exactly what they believe they need but we don't want them to believe that what we are giving is all that they need because oftentimes it's not and so really having that humility and being transparent with them and saying listen i know where you're at i know you can make it here's what i have to give you to help you there and then here's a clear explicit set of things that are are likely to get you where you need to go if we can not only say that but also ourselves get evidence and gather evidence uh, so that we have a lot of confidence in what we're saying is going to get them there that would be amazing thanks jason so moving on to the questions that have come in live today the, the first one uh, that it is both a comment and a question so i'll read it out for you it's I feel each of the recommendations is an entire lecture or long format training in itself. The one that I feel is important to drive progress is make the bike principles actionable to funders. Can you comment on how we do this or where we can go for some self-directed learning in this space? All right. Thank you very much for that question. Um, so I agree with you. These, uh, the, the bike principles right now, the website as it stands is a bit of a brain dump. Um, it's it's still the edited version of a much larger brain dump uh, of a really 30 fantastic um, uh, bright people that were uh, in that meeting. Um, but each one of those, uh, let, let me answer the question in two parts. Uh, and it's slightly related to the next question that I see from Paul that we'll get to in a moment, which is uh, we are working on also a sort of a roadmap which further digests the principles and tries to provide some more concrete ways where people can get started. But the for each of uh, each of those recommendations, there are some recommendations that that individual instructors could feasibly do by themselves, and there's some that they're not. That it would take actually a group of people coming together. Um, so that being said, the answer about make the bike principles actionable to funders um, that that will happen in many different ways. Um, so one for a funder to actually say yes i i want to mandate that my awardees uh, use the bicycle principles they're going to need evidence so they may be willing to actually fund um you or me or others here to test out some of the bicycle principles and do a bit more research to show that they really are achieving their aims so i think that's why we have the um, the forum that's there why we're going to continue to use various spaces like these to see who's interested in helping us um, because each one of those principles 
may be relevant to one community and in one context and perhaps not so much of an interest to another at the moment. So for, for now, we hope that the website will be uh, an important touch point to co go and look at and see what's happening, what where are their movements or where are communities coalescing on those. So uh, we're trying, we're very much at the beginning of this. And then could I uh, possibly answer Paul's pretty quickly? Um, yes, I can yes read absolutely. So Paul's, uh, Paul's commenting Paul that um, he's finding the the um, principles quite abstract. I definitely agree with that and suggesting that case studies and things would be very helpful as well. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just reinforce because I know we have to go to wrap up that we're working on those. Um, but for now, there's at least uh, a, a body of work. I don't suggest you read them all unless you really have nothing to do with your life. <laughs> uh, but actually find the few that are most interesting to you and go from there. Um, um, and then we we will have other more digested versions that we hope people uh, will be able to see themselves in through those case studies. But I'm going to stop talking and turn it back to Melissa because I know she has some uh, final comments for us. I do. Unfortunately, we are going to have to wrap it up for today, but this is actually a really good point to segue into the wrap up. Because in December, Jason, uh, well, rather at the end of November and in December, Jason is coming out to Australia and he's going to join us for a couple of focus group style workshops where we're going to pick and choose some of those principles and really think about what can we do to put those into action in our own training settings and kind of take them from the abstract to the kind of imaginable and doable thing. So there are two of these. The first one is being hosted by Melbourne Genomics on the 5th of December, and we'll have a focus on clinical genomics education. If you'd like more information about that one, please get in touch with Amy. And then the following day, we will have a a very similar workshop but for people working in the life sciences and digital research space this one is being hosted by australian biocommons and the details and registration link for that are up on our website following on from that and continuing our collaboration with melbourne genomics on the 7th of december we will have another webinar which will be looking at variant calling and taking it from the clinic to the lab and back again we have two different speakers joining us for that, and they're going to offer quite different perspectives on the way that they're working in this clinical genomics space. Again, the details for this webinar are up on the BioCommons website. To finish, so thank you so much, Jason, for joining us and for joining us in uh, hours that are not your usual working hours. You are based in the US like, currently. We're really looking forward to having you here in December as well. Thank you to everybody who's come along today live as well. If you would like to stay up to date with what's happening in Australian Biocommons and Melbourne Genomics, you can follow us on Twitter and you can also sign up to our newsletters and you'll find subscribe options on our website. Thanks again for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Until then, have a great day and goodbye for now. <laughs>